All right, we're in chapter 13, uh, Revelation 13, just as we talked about in chapter 12, um, was kind of an introduction to the spiritual warfare aspect that's being kind of fleshed out in great detail. Um, then chap uh, chapter 12, verse 7 to the end um, gives you uh, even greater detail. And then we get to chapter 13, we're going to even get greater detail about this. And what, what it really um, <coughs> helps us see is not just the overview, but actually down to the point at which uh, God explaining and revealing these things that Satan uses against us. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And uh, to kind of start that off, I'm just going to begin reading chapter 13. And um, I guess before I read it, just, to, just in case for some reason if you weren't here um, either last week or maybe, you know, forgot the things that we discussed, um, sometimes it's good to get a little, little concise summary. So here's a, what we saw in chapter 12. We had a, a woman that represents the people of God, both Old Testament and New Testament brings forth the child. Of course, Jesus is the one that came from the Old Testament people of God and is the king of the New Testament people of God. Um, we saw a dragon that was standing by waiting for the child to be born because he, um, the dragon, which is identified clearly as Satan, is waiting to devour the child because uh, we're told, um, he was told from the very beginning, um, back in Genesis 3, that uh, this child, this seed of the woman, was going to be his downfall, was going to put an end to him by crushing his head, even though he would be allowed to be put a hurting on him or bruise his heel. And so he was there to devour, devour the child. He was unsuccessful in doing that. Um, the woman that, uh, again, represents God's people, um, has to go into the wilderness for a time. Um, it's described as 1,260 days. It's described as three and a half years, or times, time, and a half a time. Um, and that's that repeated five times in Revelation, a couple times in the book of Daniel. That period of time is referenced as a, a time that the, the church has to seek um, refuge. And, of course, the Lord provides refuge for the faithful remnant of God's people. Uh, even uses things on the earth to absorb um, that which Satan is trying to pursue the woman, and the reason why she has to go in hiding, because this um, spirit of Antichrist that comes out of the mouth of the dragon, uh, symbolized by the river that comes out of his mouth, that's pursuing the woman, the, the earth kind of absorbs it, but she also has to go into hiding, um, and so we've talked about how during the dark, the so-called dark ages, as it's called, you know, history, um, how uh, people were in the dark, and the word of God was kind of uh, not only confused, but it was really hidden, um, and the agenda of man was allowed to, to reign for a long period of time. And um, so that's the period of time being represented by this, whether it's 42 months or 1260 days or three and a half years, um, representing that period of time in which the church had to go into hiding. So again, kind of a picture of the spiritual warfare. And we find out that Satan is cast down to the earth. We talked about how Jesus prophesied that. He saw Satan fall into the earth like lightning. I think that was in... Uh, Luke 18, maybe. Um, but anyway, that's when he saw um, that happening in his prophetic eye, if you will. That happened when um, Jesus ascended to the throne. And that's how chapter 12 starts off, that there's this battle in um, heaven. And uh, Satan's kicked out. I guess that maybe that's uh, where's that chapter 13. Chapter 13 starts out. No, no the, I think the battle 12, is 7? 12. Yeah, 12, 7. That's the second part of chapter 12, sorry. Um, so Satan's kicked out. He's thrown down to the earth. So uh, glory be to heaven's rejoice. The woe to the earth because Satan's been cast down to him. And so this uh, dragon, um, this Satan, is referred to as a beast. Here in chapter 13, um, he's going to be represented by two beasts in this part of the, the, the revelation. And that's kind of where we're going to pick up tonight. So I'm going to pick up reading in, in verse 1 of chapter 13. And I just want to kind of prime your pump there a little bit to get you back right to where we left off. Verse 1 says this, And I saw a beast rising out of the sea uh, with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns, and blasphemous names on his head. And the beast then, uh, and the beast that I saw was like a leopard, 
his feet were like a bear's, and his mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. Then they worshipped the dragon, and he said, uh, and it, for he had given his authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth utterly haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming his name and his dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. And it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And the authority was given over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. Everyone whose name is not, who has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captive he goes. If anyone is to be slain with a sword, uh, with a sword he must be slain. Here is a call for endurance and faith of the saints. Um, and then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all authority of the first beast in his, its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of uh, people. And by the signs that it was allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that it was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those uh, who would not worship the beast, image of the beast, to be slain. Also, it causes all, both great and small, um, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marketed on the right hand, uh, marked, sorry, <laughs> marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or, or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name, the beast of the beast, or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Okay, so a lot obviously going to be in this chapter to talk about. Um, but let's talk, talk about some of the obvious things, the fact that we have the um, Satan who's called a dragon in the previous chapter, and a beast, is now kind of, um, he's thrown down to the earth, okay? And so, woe to the earth and the sea, um, before, because the great dragon has been thrown down to them, and he's represented by these two beasts um, on the earth. One, the beast rising out of the sea, and one out of uh, the earth or on dry land. Uh, and so, uh, you know, of all the covering the whole earth, essentially, uh, you could divide the earth into water and land, essentially just like it was originally divided, um, how the water was gathered together and the land was gathered together. Um, now you have the beast affecting it all. and. Uh, now, a lot of times that this word is used in the, um, about God, <coughs> um, it's not actually a biblical word, but it is often represented, um, represents a biblical concept, and uh, that God is a trinity, <coughs> that God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit forms... Um, a holy trinity. Um, the Bible actually uses the word instead of trinity, which is a Latinized word, is a is the word Godhead. 
Um, it says in Colossians that all the fullness of the Godhead, you know, in Jesus, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. In other words, Jesus is fully God, just like the Father is fully God, the Son is fully God, and the Holy Spirit is fully God. There is only one God, okay? Not three gods, um, but God manifesting himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, I don't know if any human has the ability to fathom the depth of that, but just because we can't fathom the depth of how exactly all that works, I mean, I can't fathom the depth of a lot simpler things, to be honest with you. Um, but just because I can't doesn't mean it's not true or it's needlessly confusing or because it's not understood fully by mankind that it's not true. A lot of things that mankind can't fully true, understand. Um, I've never, I, I don't yet to this day fully understand how um, God specifically inspired men to write the words of, of the Bible. I believe he did because the word Bible tells me that. But how exactly that works, I know not. Um, doesn't seem to be dictation exactly, because each uh, author seems to have a bit of a difference in style of writing, but God, uh, this, God is clearly the source of it, and in fact that point is made specifically several times, um, that uh, no prophecy was ever, ever had its source in man, but holy men of God wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, that's Second Peter 1, 20 and 21. Um, so we know that by faith, we understand that. How exactly the mechanics of that are, I don't know. I've, I've, I'm not a prophet or an apostle, so they could maybe explain it better. But uh, God didn't feel the burden to share that with us. It's not material for us because it doesn't involve us. Um, our job is to understand what he's already said. Uh, we don't have to worry about how that happened. Same thing here. How God is one God, how he has a conversation within the Godhead, um, how he's able to separate him parts of himself out, I don't know. Every every illustration we can make to try to explain it mm -hmm. falls short. We could talk about water, and water has three phases of ice and steam and, and liquid. Um, it's all just one water, but that's not a great comparison. We could talk about a, a person. A person can be a father, can be a son, uh, can be a husband. Those are all different roles, but there's only one person. But that doesn't really match up either, but we could see how maybe a little bit of those things make sense uh, in a sense of opening our mind to the idea of it, but this is much more complex. I say that because there's also an unholy trinity that we're being exposed to here. And that is Satan and um, the beast and the false prophet. Um, they are, uh, I'll put the devil here as well. Um, so we have the, uh, in Satan's name, the accuser or slanderer um, by his names. Um, the beast, uh, we're going to find out, these, these two here, these two beasts, are not Satan himself. It's, it was not the same kind of trinity in which God is, because there's only one God. And yes, there is only one Satan, um, but the beast and the false prophet are not Satan, but they are um, things that Satan uses, uh, and that's what we're going to find out here. Um, as we look at these beasts here, and these three things will be used several times the further we go on to Revelation, including their demise, which is prophesied in, in Revelation 20, how about how that all ends up uh, at, at the bottom. But let's uh, kind of back up here to verse 1 and look at these a uh, couple beasts and how can we identify them. So verse 1 describes um, the beast of the sea, right? So I saw a beast coming out of the sea. And uh, he had ten horns and seven heads and ten crowns on his horns. And on each head a blasphemous name. Um, now the sea often in prophecy um, symbolizes nations and governments. Um, in fact, I'll give a, a verse for, uh, to you that does that in uh, Isaiah 17.12. Isaiah uh, 17.12 says this. Um, oh, the raging of many nations, they rage like the raging sea. Oh, the uproar of the peoples, they roar like the roar of great waters. So it's not unusual, and this is what we've been doing all along. And, the, and again, the key to Revelation is the Bible itself. You don't need your newspaper. There seems to be one interpretive model of Revelation. Get your newspaper out, see if you can figure out what these things, uh, how they line up with current events. 
Um, or you could go to the scriptures and say, okay, well, how does God tend to use these um, symbols uh, in more plain scripture? Even plain scripture has metaphor, just like when we speak um, fairly plainly. We tend to use similes, metaphors, and language. It's part of the, the art side of language, and so the Bible does that too, just like any language does. So we see God uses such things like that. Um, his point in Revelation, again, is not to confuse seeking people. Um, so seeking people, people who are seeking truth can understand truth because they source their understanding in truth, which is the word. So again, the Bible is its own best interpreter. So there's one example of it. Um, also, uh, just to give you a little uh, fast forward, um, in uh, Revelation 17, verse 15, listen to this. It says, Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So there is kind of a plan, is an explanation of the symbol um, in that particular case. But remember, um, it, this, even though it comes in chapter 17, remember this uh, the cycles that we're going through. So we're in the fourth cycle now um, of personages. We've gone through the churches, we've gone through the bowls, and we've gone through the trumpets. And now we're in the seven persons, um, or personalities, or personages, or figures, if you will that are being described in this fourth cycle of the seven cycles of Revelation. So in 17, you're in a different cycle, and there, when the waters you use is explained, so we can take that and, and apply it how when it was discussed last, we can still see, see how that works. I'm just trying to show you the uh, correlation there. Um, now, the horns are pretty well established uh, in prophecy as, as kings or kingdoms, but ultimately, it, it represents power. A horn's power, if you think about Think about it for a minute. You, you might say, well, that's a kind of a natural symbol for power. You know, if you had uh, uh, a ram, uh, its horns, its ability to fight and, and uh, defend, or um, during, uh, you know, mating season and things like that, it fights over um, mating rights and things like that. And so horns represent power. And um, so all through Daniel, we talked about this before, um, how horns represent power. So it's interesting that this beast has on it um, ten symbols of power, these ten horns that, that come from it, and also seven heads. Uh, heads represent, of course, wisdom. You think about wisdom um, being something that's found in our mind, um, and so uh, there's power and wisdom. And then um, you have a crowns on here, uh, and that's authority. A crown is a symbol of authority. Uh, or victory. In this particular case, it's not a Stephanus crown, a symbol of victory. It's a diadem, which is a uh, symbol of power and uh, a symbol of authority. Excuse me. So you got power, wisdom, and authority that's mentioned here, which is actually uh, mentioned <laughs> kind of piece by piece in the text itself later on. But you see this in the symbol, this particular beast. Pretty ugly beast, I guess, if you think about it. Most of the beasts uh, in prophecy are kind of hard to even draw because they're so kind of grotesque by normal standards, you know, various faces on one head or several heads or you know, very <coughs> strange figures, but uh, so the, 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 the powers, of course, in the, what they represent, not in the, 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 whole, uh, the whole graphic picture of what it is, but what each part represents. So um, John sees a beast wearing these uh, crowns on, uh, on the horns, whereas in the previous vision, the dragon wore crowns on its head. So when we looked at uh, that uh, before, we saw that um, in verse 3 of chapter 12, another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns on, on his head, seven diadems. And so you have something um, similarly put here, uh, slightly different in the sense that, um, I guess I should say, why do I have ten crowns on there instead of seven crowns? No, ten crowns. It says ten crowns. Okay. So, yeah, here the uh, crowns are on the horns rather than his head, on the heads. Uh, slight difference, but a lot of the imagery is the same. So now the dragon, which is identified as Satan, is represented here, and this beast is coming out of the sea in, in similar graphic detail, um, but representing the nation. So God is going to be using on the earth, not God, Satan's going to be using on the earth uh, various political... Um, or national 
uh, persecution of the church. The whole point, remember the river coming out of, the, of Satan's mouth is to pursue the woman so much where she has to go into hiding for her time. So, uh, how, so now we're told, what does this river of, of Antichrist look like? Well, it starts with, um, it's going to be political or national powers that Satan's going to use of the, of the world to oppose Christ and his church. But we're also going to find out it's more than just uh, political or national, and we talked about this a little bit in a preview, that there is religious, uh, religious um, forces on the earth that Satan will use to oppose Christ and, and his church. So that's why the idea that all religion is good is, is a terrible idea. That's, a, that's a, actually a satanic idea. That's, the, that's Satan's whole strategy, actually. Let's just think that all religion is good. Um, let's keep going on here, looking at this uh, vision here. So, um, so, again, just to summarize. In other words, uh, the dragon, Satan, is going to, who, who rules, because he's wearing the crown, right? Remember, he's the, uh, he's called, Satan is called, in uh, Ephesians, the ruler <coughs> of the kingdom of the air. And in Colossians, um, he is the ruler of the kingdom of darkness. Um, so it's a different way of describing his kingdom. Okay, so these are ways to describe his reign here on the earth, and his reign is political uh, or national. Um, if you wanted to, you could call it secular. I don't people like that word, but anyway, it's just national, <coughs> worldly power against um, persecution, and we see that it's still going on today, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I uh, heard an interesting uh, um, account or a preacher who just came back from Indonesia who gave the commencement <coughs> address at um, a Bible, a Christian college in Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim, populous Muslim country in the world. Uh, we don't hear about Indonesia, we think about Middle Eastern countries, but um, actually by population, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. Um, every graduate of this Bible college is required to plant a church to graduate and to start that church with 30 new baptized Christians. In this particular class that the preacher was, uh, which, by the way, uh, ministered not too far from where I used to live, in McLean, um, he said that the commencement address he gave, um, two of the graduating class had died before they graduated, planting churches in Indonesia. Um, serious business. Mm. There's no casual Christianity in Indonesia no. um, because you likely, I'm not sure, it wasn't a huge graduating class, I can't remember, I think he said it was like 30, but can you imagine um, maybe I got that 30 from the number of people to take to start the church, but it wasn't a lot, but, but each one of those represents 30 new Christians and a new congregation um, so these people took what they did very seriously um, so, uh, but they're fighting against Political, in this case, political power, actually. Uh, and then the, I actually heard recently, um, you, you know, isn't it interesting that we always think about uh, Muslims always being the, the bad guys and the, the killers, and yeah, there's a reason for that, of course. Um, but in India, you know, the biggest difference between India and Pakistan, which are adjacent to each other, is that Pakistan is predominantly Muslim country and India is predominantly Hindu country. Of course, in, uh, India is larger, the billion people in, in India. Um, but uh, the Hindus actually will also kill you. Um, you know, you might think about Hindus like, you know, sitting in, in, in some monastery somewhere, you know. Um, but no, they uh, also persecute. Um, so Satan uses both religious and political um, powers on the earth to persecute and try to destroy the church. Now look at uh, verse 2 
of chapter 13. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had the feet like those of a bear, and the mouth like that of a lion. And the dragon gave the beast his power, and his throne, and great authority. There's the thing I just kind of alluded to, the power uh, and authority. Uh, and the wisdom's not mentioned here, but anyway. Um, so that which Satan possesses, he's in equipping, equipping his um, people on the earth to do his bidding. Now again, it doesn't mean a hill of beans. Whether the people who are involved in this know what they're doing or not, don't know what they're doing. Uh, it didn't mean a hill of beans that Paul did not know that killing Christians was bad. Right. He was killing Christians. And uh, had he not repented after the Lord confronted him mm -hmm. and had his sins washed away, he would, have been he would have been condemned for it. But he did repent and did have his sins washed away and spent the rest of his life doing the best he could to make up for it. He can't make up for it, but he did his best to make up for it by throwing himself and trying to do but he also prayed for his fellow Jews, didn't he? That they would repent. That they would come. To, he says, look, they have a zeal for God. He says about them, Romans 10. But it's not according to knowledge. So, um, since they didn't know of God's standard of righteousness, they instead put their own standard of righteousness. Think about that for a minute. People following their own standard. You know, whoever what, uh, first said, I don't know, whoever first said the road to hell was paved with good intentions. Was 100% correct. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people on a day of judgment that think, well, I think God will just understand that I have my heart in the right place. Your heart's in, only in the right place if it's been washed and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and has been committed to, to service to Jesus. Because good intentions are not good enough. That's what Paul's whole point was. My prayer for his fellow Jews was for their salvation. He said, I, I know exactly what they're going through because I did the same thing. I, I, I had zeal. Paul says, you want to see my credentials card for, ze for, for zealotry? <laughs> I persecuted the church. That's how zealous I was. I thought I was doing the Lord's bidding. But in, re in reaction, you know, what, you know what the Lord said to Paul on the road to Damascus? Paul, Paul, why are you, or Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then he says, he, when he says, well, who are you, Lord? He said, well, I'm the one you're persecuting. Uh, Jesus of Nazareth and he, he says why, why are you kicking against the goads in other words I've been trying to guide you you said you were seeking God and I was trying to guide you towards me and all you did was you know, can you imagine uh, a goad by the way it's like a back then it was like a sharp stick right it's what they would um, get cattle and, and things uh, livestock to move like a cattle prod today it's what you get them to do what you want them to do so a sharp stick you would stick them and make them go and Jesus says, I've been trying to goad you, and you just keep, you know, you've seen the animal do that. <laughs> Stop that. <laughs> so that's what you were doing to me. You know, I was trying to get you where you're supposed to be going. You just kept rebelling. You kept uh, kicking it off. And uh, we got to be careful that when the Lord is trying to guide us in a direction, we don't constantly push against it. So I want you to think about this um, beast for a second. Uh, it's got, it resembles a leopard. But don't have, it doesn't have much of a leopard like i ever seen because I've been to the zoo. But uh, it's got feet like a bear and a mouth of a lion. <laughs> um, so, uh, barefoot. <laughs> he's barefoot, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's he's pretty good. I, I hadn't caught that one. <laughs> he appears here tonight, folks. <laughs> oh, Drew must be upstairs because he probably would have said it first. <laughs> That's like one of his jokes. <laughs> um, uh, Either listen or follow along with me in Daniel 2 for a minute. You know, don't, don't go too far from Revelation. But in Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to read several verses here. Um, because there's a similar vision in Daniel 2. And I want you to begin thinking about um, the vision that John saw and some of the similar imagery. Um, if you were uh, a Christian that was familiar with the Bible, when, when you first received this letter, you would no doubt think about this imagery that that Daniel, uh, Daniel 2 talks about. Daniel 2, verse 2. Here's Daniel um, explaining. I wonder if that's the right. Uh, I don't think that's the right. Verse 2. Yeah, that's not right. I think it's 7. What'd you say? It's 7. Yeah, that's what I just said to myself. 
Uh, it's actually chapter 7. Let me change that in my notes. I got, I got Daniel 2, but it's actually Daniel 7. When I was reading it, I said, that's not Daniel 2. Daniel 7, verse 2. Okay, there we go. Now, 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 I want you to remember what we just read in Revelation and listen to what Daniel saw. Verse 2. Um, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up a great sea. All right? We just talked about the beast in the sea, right? And four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion, had eagle's wings. Then I looked, with his wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one, like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs in its mouth and between its teeth. And it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. Um, and after this I looked, and behold, another, like a leopard, with four wings, on its, uh, wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and uh, dominion was given to it. Um, and then, uh, after this, I saw a night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful, exceedingly strong. Uh, by the way, here the beast is not identified as an animal. You notice that? It's called a fourth beast. Um, but he has straight, uh, great iron teeth that devoured um, and broken pieces and stamped what was left with his feet. And uh, it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Um, I would suggest to you that th this... Uh, beast here is represented um, in, in, uh, by John. Of course, John sees almost like an amalgamation, a com combination of these beasts. But we find out that each of these beasts, if you keep reading through uh, um, Daniel, you find out that these beasts are the nations. Because a lot of the point of the prophecies given to, da to Daniel were to give the timeline for the Messiah to come and establish his kingdom. That was the point of the first dream that, that uh, Daniel rose to fame in Babylon for, for telling Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was and then interpreting the dream, the, the statue with the, the head of gold and the, uh, the chest of uh, silver and then um, the uh, abdomen of uh, bronze and then legs and feet of uh, iron and toes mixed with iron and clay. Um, and then we find out those are four successive kingdoms uh, where, uh, where Nebuchadnezzar is told that, well, you're the first one here because you're the head of gold. And after you, there's going to be another kingdom. And then there's going to be another kingdom. And then there's going to be another kingdom. And he's told during the days of that kingdom, in the days of those kings, which, by the way, are represented by the ten toes, um, in the days of those kings, God, you know, God's going to set up an, uh, uh, an eternal kingdom. Um, that will never be destroyed. And, it's, and, and in turn, it will destroy all the other kingdoms. So John is seeing a bit of all. He's got the leopard imagery. He's got the bear imagery, you know. Um, and he sees all this together. Uh, and, uh, of course, we've already talked about the, the wings in this case were actually given to the church to fly away and, and take up refuge. Um, but... Uh, so again, you kind of um, see how those world powers, or if you want to call them empires, okay, um, and in Daniel's day, he was saying there's going to be four empires, and during the time of the fourth <coughs> empire, God's going to establish his kingdom. So again, you had, uh, of the four from Daniel, you had Babylon, you had Persia, or sometimes called the Medo-Persian Empire. You had the Greek Empire, and you had the Roman Empire. And lo and behold, just like was told to, to uh, Daniel in the days of uh, the Roman Empire, um, the Messiah was born, wasn't he? And uh, I mean, the, the, the Rome had been an empire for, we'll see, Julius Caesar started when, around 44? Yes. Or was that when he died? 44. 44. When he died? Yes. Yeah. When he died, right? Uh, in the eyes of March. Um, and uh, so it had been uh, <coughs> an empire after the uh, Greek Empire, after it had conquered Alexander the Great and all the Greeks there. And uh, so Messiah came, died, and established his kingdom, sits on the throne, just as was kind of overviewed in the previous chapter. You know, the, 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 the male child goes, um, ascends up, um, and because the dragon was unsuccessful in stopping him. And I want you to think about that for a minute because there's something interesting about this beast that's mentioned. Actually, both beasts, beasts 
that are mentioned that's significant about that. Um, so again, I just want you to see that if you were reading this, you would start thinking, oh yeah, I remember reading this. And so you would maybe, if you had to refresh your memory, you'd go back and, and remember what, you know, the fact that these, uh, these images, these beasts that are described this way were world empires, okay? So you kind of get that um, message from this vision. So these kind of anti-Christian governments or empires that are used here, um, using political power to try to stamp out Jesus and his kingdom. Notice in verse 3, that says, um, One of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound has been healed. And the whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Um, so that was in verse 3 of uh, back in Revelation. <coughs> 13. Now I think that's uh, a bit interesting. Um, why might that, uh, why do you think having a seemingly fatal head wound would be significant? Yeah. Genesis, right? I will, he will crush your head, he will bruise your heel. Alright? I mean the other way around. You bruise his heel, he'll crush your head. Um, this is what God said to the serpent, to the dragon. And so, um, he looks like he was uh, going to be dead and gone. He was cast down and thrown down to the earth. Got what looks like a fatal head wound, but Satan's not completely powerless yet. Uh, eventually, it'll catch up with him, and that will be a, a fatal head wound. Um, but right now, it looks like it's, it's healed, because he's still wreaking havoc. He's still causing problems, even though he's been somewhat limited. Because remember, the whole point was, the gates of Hades shall not prevail, which means death no longer has ultimate dominion anymore, because now Jesus has overcome death. And now uh, those in Christ have been reconciled and, and brought back to life, even though they were spiritually dead. That's why, how often do we hear in, in the letters of the New Testament, you know, you were dead, but now you are, you are alive. Um, one of the, the famous ones in <coughs> Romans 6, for instance, um, might be worth uh, just throwing out there to remind you. But uh, li listen to how he starts Romans 6, verse 1. And how sh then shall we live? Oh, sorry, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father we too might walk in newness of life and so we were raised from the dead just like Jesus was raised from the dead we were raised from the dead not physical death but in this case spiritual death um, and then he goes on talking about our old self should have died when we buried it and our new self our resurrected self is not supposed to be like the old self it's a new self and new life um, but Satan yet pursues us, um, and so he's, he has a fatal wound, which seems to be a fatal wound, but uh, it looks like it might have been healed, but it just hasn't caught up with him yet. So he still has power. Um, as I uh, mentioned, Revelation 17 talks a little bit about this as well. Um, talks about seven kings. In fact, here we have uh, um, seven heads, right? And uh, it says here in, in Revelation 17.10, they are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other is yet to come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. We'll talk about that in chapter 17. But I just want you to see there's continuity. And that's why um, it's important not to see these cycles as linear. In other words, well, we talked about seven churches, and then what happened after the seven churches? There are actually people who interpret it this way. Well, then there were seven seals. And then there were, you know, seven trumpets, and then there were seven persons. No, these are all talking about the same thing. And then we go through all seven of them, they're just <coughs> looking at the same thing with greater and greater detail. So sometimes I throw, I get a little head to throw you some of the, the stuff that's up and coming when we, we will talk about the greater detail when we get there. Um, but just want you to, I'm sure if I'm erasing or marking there. Okay. All right, therefore, it says, um, the statement that uh, we look here in the text that one of the heads received his death stroke um, kind of talks about one of these 
kings or empires uh, has ceased uh, for a while and um, most likely the reason why God even foretold in prophecy about this wound to the head is that again is you're going to be struck down for a time but he's still going to be uh, active for a while but what happens during this time we'll talk about the, again I'm, I'm, I'm trying to resist going through all the detail now because obviously if God wanted us to talk about that now he would have put it in this section but so I'll just <laughs> stick with this uh, okay so the result basically the whole world um, is in marvel of this beast um, so look back at verse uh, oops I'm in Romans 6 in verse um, 4. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. So think about that for a minute. So the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the one who leads the kingdom of darkness, has given power and authority to these political um, powers and authority. And so uh, it's interesting. Um, I think it's a, it's a miss understanding when we say, well, everyone who, uh, we say, we often say it's about presidents, about ones we like anyway, right? You know, <laughs> try to defend them. Well, you know, so-and-so wouldn't be president. God didn't want him to be. Um, well, only in the most general sense, okay? Um, God allowing someone to rule is not necessarily saying, uh, I mean, you could say on one hand he wants it because by allowing it, he wants to allow it. But, because, uh, but to, to say that anyone who's a king is, has an, the endorsement of God would be the wrong understanding. I would think that would be pretty obvious. We can see some pretty, um, you know, if we choose to look outside our own country to other rulers or rulers in the past and say, well, they probably um, weren't working on God's side. Um, because, yeah, there's obviously political authority people who are in the world who are not working for God, they're actually working against God. And um, trying to, uh, that's why we, we should not be surprised when we see governments being antichrist, because Satan is trying to pervert them, <coughs> or win them to his cause, use them to persecute the church. Um, and so, again, we, we, we see it, evidence around us, um, the further our country gets from God, and, and um, while it's true you're either with God or against him, um, at the same time I think we could also understand following righteous principles is going to bring about more righteousness versus um, removing yourself from righteousness is, is going to work even less righteousness. I mean it's not really hard to concept. It doesn't mean just because um, you know, there were times when governments might have been favorable to Christianity that um, they were necessarily righteous because God used Nebuchadnezzar um, and led him to judge his own people. Does that mean that, that the Nebuchadnezzar and God were real tight? No, it doesn't mean that at all. <laughs> but God used him for his purposes. And so he actually told, if you remember this, studying this in Ezekiel, Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel, and Ezekiel told the Jews, he said... Uh, I'm going to use Nebuchadnezzar against you because Nebuchadnezzar has this, uh, this practice of using a divining rod, which means, you know, he, he to decide which nation he's going to go conquer next. He would use what seemed to be sorcery to figure out where he should go next. He's going to consult the, the gods. And so next time he does that, I'm going to point that stick right at you. And he's going to come after you because you won't listen to me. So God used that process. So uh, it's sometimes hard for us to understand that, but God... Um, allows things, even causes things, to work out his um, glory. doesn't mean that he takes away people's free will, but he does uh, use their own sin against them sometimes. Uh, and that's, uh, that's our own decision, I guess, to, to engage in unrighteousness, and then we got to pay the consequences for it. Um, so, um, verse 4, this kind of uh, worshiping the dragon. Uh, don't... don't um, don't think about this as overt Satanism. Certainly that fits into the category. Anybody who literally worships Satan would fit into this category. But you don't have to, there's all, all kinds of false um, worship of political powers. I mean, the idea of Caesarism, being a Caesar was you were a god. 
and um, you insisted pe people worship you as a god, and you equated yourself with a god. And uh, so that's how a lot of people got into trouble sometimes. That's how Christians got into trouble with the Roman Empire when they refused to worship Caesar, uh, things like that. So uh, kind of an interesting, um, just a verse about that. Uh, Exodus 15, 11 says, Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who uh, like you is majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, and working wonders? So there's no one like God. No one can be compared to God. Um, but uh, notice what they say. What, who is like the beast? See the difference? When God is, when, when uh, Moses here is worshiping God, they're saying, God, there's nobody like you. But this is what they're saying about the beast. Who is like you? Verse 4, right? Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? In other words, they're impressed with um, the, uh, the power of war that these political, these empires use. The, I mean, let's face it. Uh, these political em, uh, empires were pretty impressive. You could throw Egypt on there too, even though that wasn't in Daniel's timeline. Um, it's, they're pretty impressive. Uh, Babylon, certainly Alexander, uh, Hannibal, which is called uh, in the Greek period of time. Um, I mean, the amount of people that Julius Caesar conquered was astounding. Um, I mean, basically conquered all, all of northern Europe. And that's how he became Caesar. How, how did Caesar become Caesar? In a place that was supposed to be a democracy and had a senate. Well, when you go conquer half the world, who's going to say no to you? Besides the fact, a lot of people just, hey, there's an impressive guy, let's follow him. You know? I mean, uh, here that's what uh, essentially Revelation's saying. They're, they're impressed by his prowess, his, his physical, his uh, warlike prowess and being able to, to conquer the world. And so, yeah, let's follow that guy. He, he, we all know people who are drawn to power like that, right? Um, I, I think we all agree if things exist like that in our own government have for some time, right? Probably as long as our government's been around, there's people who, who are drawn to government because they, they're drawn to the power and they're drawn to people who have power and want to be, and be like them. Yeah, a bunch of, you know, sycophants and uh, yes men, you know, that uh, want to get favor from those who are powerful. Uh, look at verse uh, 5. So the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority uh, for 42 months. Um, one might think about Nebuchadnezzar that I just referenced on Sunday morning that was puffing himself up, wasn't he? So, in, in other words, Satan's allowing his people to think, hey, it's all, it's all you, man. You're the man. You're, you're the one that uh, is doing all this and uh, because you're full of yourself. And again, it's amazing how how much people want to follow other human beings as well. So they're, they're worshiping the beast, essentially, these political powers that are being under the direction and influence of, of Satan himself. And so he was given this authority, and again, this, this time period referenced again. When is this oppression going to be so uh, dramatic during these 42 months, 1260 days, three and a half years? Um, and then, um, well, just, just a few verses about that. Uh, back to, uh, uh, you don't have to turn there, but just a couple of verses. One from uh, Daniel 7, 8, uh, about the beast. Um, his mouth that spoke boastfully is referenced there. In verse 25 of Daniel 7, He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change and set times and the laws. Uh, and the saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. Again, the same period of time in, in, uh, in Daniel um, and then in uh, Daniel 11:36, the king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard uh, of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is complete, for what has been determined must take place. So this is talking, referencing the so-called little horn of Daniel, which some people equate to the boogeyman um, antichrist. We might discuss certainly that figure is Antichrist. This is Antichrist. This is Antichrist. Everything against Christ is Antichrist. Uh, that's how John defines it, not just me, right? Um, and he talks about it in there. Okay, just about done here. Um, 
Verse 5 actually says there the beast was given, indicating that the power was, that there was power behind the beast. He already has the power. Satan uses everyone and everything he can to accomplish his will against God. Uh, blasphemy. Literally the word blasphemy means to speak against. Okay? So blasphemies are understood as being kind of slanderous, hurtful things. It's exactly what Satan does. He speaks against God. Uh, we gave the example in uh, the garden, right? Um, he, he, he buddies up to Eve and like he's just there to be a, a voice of reason, good advice, and, and the next thing you know, he directly contradicts and attacks God's motives, God's nature. You know, he says, well, you will surely not die. So he contradicts, speaks against what, the truth that God given. And he also says, well, God just doesn't want you to be like him. So that's why he gave you this rule. So he goes after speaking against God about who God actually is. And so those kind of blasphemies, you, you see it all the time coming out uh, from the world. And, and Satan's behind it all. So this uh, time of intense particular persecution, obviously Revelation is preparing God's people um, to recognize this. Because if you look there in... Um, the end of verse, uh, no, sorry, not the end, sorry, the end of the first half of verse of chapter 13, verse 10, notice, here's the, the punchline. He, here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Why would God foretell of all of this? Why would he talk about a particular time, however you want to interpret that period of time, which is referenced seven times total between Revelation and, and the book of Daniel uh, of the 42 months and 1260 days and three and a half times um, is um, a particular period of intense persecution so that way when it seems like all hope is lost you would recognize that all hope is not lost that's a pretty it's a pretty important thing don't you think mm -hmm. in your darkest hour in a time when it seems like nothing good can come from this, a promise from the Almighty God that something good will happen, something good will come. All, all your job is, faithful Christian, well, is to be faithful and to persevere and to endure. Um, particularly important, I think, if you think about it. I think, uh, you know, I told you, it, it, I can only imagine what it would like to be in that position. I've not been in a position like that of severe persecution. Um, it's hard enough for me just to hear the endless loop of bad news you know, <coughs> that people want to talk about all the time. So I, I just kind of divorced myself from that because I'm not going to get caught up in that, that loop of continuous negativity because my king's on the throne. Amen. You know? So I'm going to persevere. I'm going to do his will. And even when it seems... Uh, by look by by my eyes that doesn't look like righteousness is winning. I know that he's won, and and all this evil one day will come to an end. And so I I persevere. I'm going to be faithful. Mm -hmm. But these guys uh, who went through that period of time were through a particularly difficult time. So how much more is it important it is to be encouraged by the Lord Himself that don't lose heart. All right. Um, yeah, so verse 6, he opened his mouth to blaspheme God, to slander his name and his dwelling place in those who live uh, in heaven. And uh, so I didn't get all the way through. I thought maybe I'd actually get through 10, but um, because you kind of, this is the beast of the sea. I thought maybe we'd go to the beast of the earth next time, but uh, uh, there's still quite a bit of things I want to talk about, so I'm not going to try to rush through it for no reason. Um, Maybe, you know, this would be a good exercise at this point. We, here we are, chapter 13. We are more than halfway through Revelation, believe it or not. Um, oh, when do we start this? Who was president? When I <laughs> uh, was it last January we started? Or this January? You may remember. I really don't remember. It was a while ago. I think it was this January, wasn't it? Yeah, it was January 30th. Yeah, pretty good. That's pretty good. So here we are. It's almost October. Yeah. Um, so sometime in January, you're thinking? Yeah. So here we are. It's been nine months. It's been nine months, and um, we're about halfway through Revelation. So you've had Ezekiel, Daniel, and half of Revelation now, a little more than half of Revelation. 
maybe why don't you read the rest of this chapter and see if you can recognize any of these symbols that jump out to you. Not to get them all, but maybe something makes me think of something. And uh, I mean, it, it won't. Uh, I don't really recommend this for Bible study, generally speaking, but you, you could try to Google it, or maybe you could look up the word in a concordance or something. You know, in other words, uh, in a Bible search thing, type the word in there and see what it comes up. Maybe you might remember what it says about it. But maybe someone will just help you remember, oh, I remember something, something about this or something like that. It might be interesting just to help you begin to think about how the first recipients of this probably would have heard it. Because, mm -hmm. again... They were probably much more familiar with these things than we tend to be. So uh, it might be interesting, and you might uh, you might realize that you've learned a little bit more than you thought of. So. All right, anybody have any questions to finish this out tonight? All right, well, let's close with a word of prayer. Lord God, I thank you for your hello. I thank you for your word and for your blessings. Sorry. <laughs> it doesn't want you to shut it. <laughs> I guess not. I'm doing something strange to it. Okay, I'm just going to shut it all down. <laughs> Which beast is the technology? <laughs> Sorry, I've uh, got bad concentration. Um, Father, we're thankful that we live in a time and a place where we truly don't have to suffer yet as much as other people do. We pray for the persecuted church, the church that um, is still in hiding where they are. And God, maybe um, this, it would be not out of line to even think that that period of time is, is just that, a period of time where um, that will all exist during a church age, even though maybe it seems like to be a definite period. Because so certainly we know that um, whether it's wide or intense persecution all over the earth, we certainly know that there are people in many places in the earth today still that have to suffer a lot for their faith in you. God, I, I pray that we would be able to have the kind of faith that they have to persevere, even without all that persecution that we would have the kind of dedication and commitment and um, take what you're telling us here even in, in the end of verse 10 there to, to have faithful endurance for all of God's people, the saints. That we would not let anything separate us from your love knowing that no one can without our permission. Only we can give up. Only we can turn our back on you. Otherwise, nothing can separate us from your love. So, Father, I, I pray um, that you help us to be focused, because sometimes we can be lulled into a false sense of security and thinking because we don't have intense bodily persecution that we're not being persecuted. We just don't recognize it as easily. Maybe it's easier if someone pointed a gun, a gun at us and we knew that our faith was being threatened rather than just being lulled into some kind of spiritual stupor or sleep that we wouldn't be so easily misled or you know, focusing on wrong things and having allegiance to wrong things. But ultimately our allegiance uh, and our faith and strength and hope are all drawn from you. God, thank you for loving us and trying so hard to open up our spiritual <coughs> eyes to see these things that are around every single one of us. Because we know Satan, though God ultimately has been given, a, dealt a fatal wound that ultimately one day he will be thrown into the lake of fire and forever rendered powerless but until then he does have power if we let him have it in our own life let us who have been redeemed by your blood of your son resist because we know when the promise we're given is we resist and he has to flee but God help us to fight and be steadfast in that fight we pray in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Yeah. 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 Yeah.